three, two, one, let's go. So thank you so much for joining me and thank you for being here. I am Casey and we're here to talk about the stories we got into last week. That usually means movies and TV, but really can mean anything. There are probably going to be critiques in there, but this is supposed to be a place to talk about the shows and the stories we love without really being a dick about it. I hope everything comes across as fair and earnest because really all we're doing is reflecting on all the hard work that these creators put into these projects. We really are just here to spread some love for the things we love, and I particularly love stories and storytelling, so hopefully people find something of interest here I'm talking about and explore it for themselves. Otherwise, we are taking October to celebrate two slasher franchises. Every Friday, there's going to be something a little more substantial. First, we're going to have some videos in the Friday the 13th movies, followed by the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. But that is all I have in the ways of updates and introducing things, so let's get going into the fourth week of September 2024. 19! 19- 1978's The Bees. Now there is an art to acting to an oddly constructed script and improvised scenes that John Saxon is just master. His performance in juxtaposition to every death sequence made a bonkers eco-horror premise memorable and fun. From start to finish, this is quality and earnest camp at its best worst, if that is what you get into. 1975's The Terror of Mecha Godzilla. As much as I love Mecha G, I do wish this movie went by the title of Terror of Titanosaurus instead. As far as kaiju go, this really is her movie, or at least the first half of it anyway, as for much of the runtime we are either searching for, directly fighting, or talking about this specific kaiju. A kaiju that we haven't seen in nearly 50 years on the big screen. The human plot incorporates itself a little better than previously with strong connections to some of the main cast, both for Titanosaurus and Mecha G. Honestly, Godzilla is the biggest out liar in this movie plot-wise, just kind of showing up more than halfway through in an otherwise well-paced narrative. The most generally accepted use of stock footage is used in the opening recap of the previous fights between Mechagodzilla and his namesake, but they also show up in a few quick effects later in the picture, which, you know, you never like to see, but we recognize they were absolutely under a tight budget. It does make every shot with Titanosaurus that much more exciting, since those sequences are new sequences shot, like, really dynamic dynamically with well angles. This has always felt like a bit of a deflated ending to Godzilla's Showa era, but at the same time, it really was not intended to be that, but became so by circumstance. This movie has some genuinely strong themes, concepts, actors, and tokusatsu action, but it also falls apart a little bit during the edit at a few points. I feel like I'm not selling this well, but I, I did really enjoy this one throughout. 1997's The Hills Have Eyes. Now, I definitely need to rewatch this again when I am able to pay a little more attention. It's It's been a really stressful week at school. From what I gather, a family unit has some trouble when road tripping in the worst hills they possibly could have. Since, you know, the, the hills apparently have eyes and all of that. Systematically being hunted down by good old-fashioned hill cannibals. From what I recall, it felt very Texas Chainsaw in both its rock camera work and its vast array of personalities. If that's your bag, you'll probably like the hills have eyes. 2007's The Black Cat. Guess who was stretching the limits of what they can do and write about in an English essay and now has to crack out a 3,000 word essay on the thematic importance of black cat and adaptations. This version plays as if the story is happening to the famously troubled author of the poem itself, Edgar Allan Poe, gently twisting some of the events to present a very straightforward adaptation that retains the very important themes of temperance and or the dangers of alcoholism when there is a seemingly mystical cat mulling about. The standout of this piece is absolutely Jeffrey Combs. He owns the story from beginning to end, showing the life out of every frame he is on camera. I'd watch this just for Jeffrey Combs. The Black Cat from 1934. What? Does Frankenstein's monster as an eerily predictive labor camp architect and the kidnapper of Dracula's daughter have to do with Edgar Allan Poe's short classic story? I don't know really had to stretch to find a theme other than contains a black cat. It does explore the themes of detrimental masculinity and have a bunch of revenge things, I guess. 2012's Dread. Simply one of the best constructed and entertaining science fiction and action motion pictures following a hard-ass super cop and his psychic Draney being forced to systematically make their way to the top of a high-rise out of J.G. Ballard's dreams. The movie balances a lot of small arms gun combat with well-choreographed hand-to-hand sequences, neither of which hold back in the slightest when it comes to dis- 
displaying this beautifully choreographed violence. 2024's Oddity. Please excuse me resisting the urge to add the Operation Buzz sound effect to that otherwise creepy fucking sequence in this movie. At its core, Oddity is a well-shot, well-performed, mystical, psychological mystery thriller about a horror husband, I mean widow, and his now dead wife's self-professed paranormal sister doing creepy shit in an isolated location. Not going to lie, I think a lot of this movie went over my head, but it is more than competently made with some great practical set pieces and amazingly tense sequences in this movie. 1942's Bambi. Feels like you either fall into the category of Bambi emotionally shattered me growing up, or The Lion King emotionally shattered me growing up. I am part of the latter. Which isn't to say I didn't love this movie, I did. Whether I find the plot or lack thereof slow or not, this isn't really a movie about the narrative. It's about instilling this deep feeling of anxiety and fear in the audience that they are Lovecraftian monsters to the plethora of cute forest animals that they adore. Man humanizes the same creatures man glorifies in slaughtering, asking whether it is our right, our purpose, or our duty to terrorize the forest and the beings within. Bambi is also just fucking adorable. Truly one of the best examples of the traditional animation of animals. I do not personally love the backgrounds in every scene, but also understand the importance of not visually cluttering the screen with 1,000 individual leaves. Frank Churchill's soundtrack is also beautiful throughout the movie. This was also my first time seeing the picture in its entirety somehow. First time I've gotten to watch the finale and it goes far harder than I expected. So yeah, that is everything we really got and watched last week. Otherwise, thank you for sticking with me through the whole video. I hope everyone got to watch something special and fun last week in their own right, and I'd love to hear whatever that was for you. Again, yeah, next month is October, so we are doubling down on what slashers mean to us with Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street videos. Otherwise, thank you for being you and being great, and just go out there and kick ass today.